call it the tap room license. I don't know, you gotta use the tap room license. The tap room license. Uh, one of the things that was important for, for Fulton was uh, the relationship that we were having with people. And I'm sure a lot of you here tonight came with a friend, came with your spouse, uh, and you're on a date. For us, when we're brewing, whether it's with ourselves at the brewery, home brewing, whether we're at a bar, we're, we're doing things in a community. And that experience, we wanted to bring into the group. And it's great to go to bars like the Republic and others that have a great beer community, but to share that experience on our terms, to show people where the beer is being brewed, to collaborate potentially on an idea for a future group, that's something that Minnesota was missing. So when the opportunity came to change that line, bring that opportunity to the, the great beer community we have today, that, that was kind of the catalyst for us. I'll just add, um, I don't know if we said it earlier, I'm also a member of Fulton with Jim, um, so sort of his guest, but um, I like to think it's equal, although I got the, the, the worst chair in the room, so. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter. <laughs> um, just to add to what these guys have already said, um, it, well, it was probably long overdue, but it was definitely, um, for a lot of reasons, I think the right time for a lot like this to happen in Minnesota. Um, I, uh, when I was in business school, did a research project on starting a brewery in Minnesota, and it was probably the one and only really productive thing I did out of school, so um, it worked anyway. Um, but uh, we researched what the scene in other states was, and if you look at uh, states that are very similar in size and demographics, like uh, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, um, almost exactly the same size, a lot of other similarities, and they all had four times as many breweries as Minnesota, and um, we're trying to dry, draw conclusions as to why that might be, and um, the, the big thing that I walked away with, and it's my opinion, but all of those states have a more favorable legal environment for brewers, so when you're very, very small getting started, um, like we are, you uh, need every sale you can get, and if you can bring people into the brewery, um, introduce them to your brand and your beer that way, uh, you're probably building a, a long-term relationship with that, that customer, and uh, it's a sale for you. And um, there are a lot of limitations on Minnesota breweries being able to do that in the past, and so to have something like this possibly change would not only help us individually as a company, but we thought it would be great for the whole beer community here, and hopefully foster the growth of more breweries in the state, and that's ultimately one of those things where all ships can rise with the tide. I think that's a great point. Um, I think we were all realized when we're up in St. Paul um, uh, talking to legislators, uh, going through what we're going through. It wasn't, you know, yes, it was certainly, you know, obviously for certainly it was part of, you know, a plan of ours to build a new brewery and all that, but I think, you know, I can speak for these guys, Liftbridge guys working really hard on it, that I think we all want to see a better beer scene here in Minnesota. And, uh, you know, it feels like it wasn't a fight just for us, but for a lot of people. I mean, this is going to create, I think it's going to create a lot more breweries uh, in the state because it's going to make it easier to, to open a brewery because it's really hard. It takes a ton of money, um, and any little thing you can do to help um, keep the doors open in the beginning is a huge deal. Being able to sell a pint of beer to someone is a really big deal when you're just starting out. And I remember when I was uh, did an apprenticeship at New Holland Brewing uh, in 2004 uh, slash 5, um, over there in Michigan, breweries can have bars, they can have restaurants, uh, they can sell kegs, bottles, cans, well, they can pretty much do, do a lot of stuff. And I told the guys um, my plan of starting a brewery in Minnesota, uh, the two founders of New Holland, and I think at that time they were the third largest brewery in Michigan, about seven or eight years old. And they said there was no way they would start a brewery um, if they weren't able to sell pints of beer when they started. So it's just really an important part to, to getting a new brewery going, and I, I think that's a big part of, um, I think, why we all did this. It, was, it wasn't just for us. We wanted to see more breweries um, growing, because I think that just helps the beer scene uh, in the state. And I think we're gonna, you know, we've certainly seen a few new ones uh, uh, popping up here, and uh, I'm sure that will continue for, for quite a few more years. 
you guys have talked a little bit about the impact of this legislation on the local beer scene and some of the thoughts that went into it. What do you think were some of the most important factors in getting this change in the law, and how does that affect future changes that might also help open up the beer scene in Minnesota and kind of changing the policy environment to make it a little bit more friendly? Wow. Factors that made it important to change. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing that I found in really making headway with the committees, which for us I felt was really the, the starting point for the legislation. If it was going to pass, it was going to have to come on there, obviously. But telling the story, not just from the economic point of view, but really from the personal side, why it mattered not only to, to us and to what we had invested in our business, but what it meant for others in Minnesota that wanted to become involved in the brewing industry. And for the reasons that were just touched on in terms of growth, um, that's what I think really leveraged the position because there were some pretty big obstacles to passage of the tap room, whether it was the retailers or the wholesalers. I mean, some of that came through the media early on. Um, but it was that connection to people, and that I thought was very important. Sure. Some other changes in the policy and legal environment that you think would help 
Minneapolis and Minnesota compete with Colorado, Portland, those kinds of areas, what what other policy obstacles are there? Um, I guess one, you know, obviously one a lot of folks know about is uh, in, uh, you know, we still have a separation between brew pubs and breweries and, you know, that didn't change with this law and, and there's some nuanced stuff that, that between those two that I don't know if they're going to change. Um, and, and, you know, that's certainly something that, you know, there's a little more options for someone to be a brew pub but still be able to sell their beer off, off site. But, you know, there still is that division which uh, doesn't exist in some other states, so that's certainly one. Uh, is an issue, and the other one is that you can't sell your beer to go if you will. You can't sell beer off premise in a brewery, you can't sell can, bottles, kegs, um, once you're you know, over a certain size. Um, I mean, that's one of the differences. I don't think that's either of those are ones that I don't think that take on because, you know, those are pretty, you know, these fights are big ones, and that's what the opposition is pretty, pretty entrenched. Yeah, I think I'd second that uh, entrenched opposition. Uh, wholesalers and, and retailers are, are pretty firm in their ways. Uh, I, I think one of the great options for for future change is to the off-sale uh, component. And it may not be a uh, full off-sale as, as Michigan or Ohio or Indiana, uh, where you can come to a brewery and get a keg, a six-pack, that sort of thing. But that, the current limit on 3,500 barrels of total production um, when you surpass that, you can no longer sell growlers to someone that comes in the brewery. Uh, I personally think it was arbitrary when it was decided and probably deserves to be re-looked at. Um, Omar, last year's barrel agent survey was how much? Roughly? Uh, 11,000. And this year, we're hoping to do 12. And we are, always have this discussion. 20, 20 to 10. Jim is not the math guy, he's the policy guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, in our first full year in our brewery here in Minnesota, which will be next year, we just started brewing there in, about two months ago. The first full year, we hope to do about 3,000 barrels, um, which, um, if we had a bigger year than expected, or certainly the following year, if we continue to grow, would place us in jeopardy of going over the limit for selling growlers, which one second advertorial, we're opening for dollar sales on Friday. <laughs> um, back to the regular program though. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the uh, the reasoning behind the 3,500 barrel limit that was originally put on place for brewery selling growlers was, um, but it's certainly not that once you've reached that point at a brewery, you've made it and it's easy from there because uh, you know we're looking at our our planning and, and our hope, hopefully anticipated growth, and um, it's, it's going to be tough if we happen to go over that that uh, 3,500 barrel threshold in a year or two, because all of a sudden it's this uh, really important revenue stream that's kind of pulled out from under you, and then you have to make that up with kind of like what Omar was talking about earlier, um, growing a lot in that year just to make up for what you've lost, um, not to mention actually continue to grow. So that I think is one thing that could change. Yeah, and, and, and just to kind of continue on, uh, my, my point is I think it should be up to Surly. I think it should be up to Fulton, or I think it up to be, should be up to you name the brewery. At what point growlers no longer make sense? Uh, there's a lot of work that we are going to soon discover about them, and I'm sure Omar can tell stories about staying up late and either cleaning the growlers or, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> um, And so I, I think instead of having it legislated from St. Paul where it makes sense for that brewer, that's where it, the decision to stop doing growers should be. And also, 750 milliliters fall into that category. And obviously there's some great beers put into 22 ounce bottles or 750s. Um, it, I think the limit that exists today almost keeps a brewery from experimenting in those mediums. If that cap was lifted, it would make a lot more sense to maybe experiment with some smaller batch brewers aging beer in those bottles. And I think as that caught on, that would benefit everybody from the standpoint of yes, the beer would be at the, available at the breweries, but it would also be available at your local liquor store, at your local, you know, on sale premise. And uh, I think that benefits the craft beer community at home. Okay.
I know you guys at Fulton are planning on some ex pretty rapid expansion here at Big Quick with the new location by Target Field. And along with those changes, what other changes are you guys who are plugged in and know the industry well seeing in the beer economy, in the beer industry, in Minnesota, not necessarily from a policy point of view, but just in general? Where are things going in your esteemed opinions? Well, I think there's a lot more, obviously, with um, you know, a lot more breweries we kind of mentioned. I think that's coming. There will be a lot coming. We've got probably, what, four or five in the next few months, six months or so, or maybe the next year. Um, so that's one big change. I think the other I think the other big change is on this side of things. We're in a bar, and I think we're going to see a lot more um, craft beer bars or, beer, or bars that focus on craft beer. And when we started, um, there were a handful of, of bars in the Twin Cities that had craft beer. And there were not a lot. There was McKenzie's and Blue Nile and Happy Dome and Money Bay and um, uh, BLB. Um, and those kind of seemed to be the, you know, the ones where, the, for me, kind of the ones that I was drinking at, the ones where, where things got going. And there are a lot more craft beer bars now. And I see that they're kind of now being put together as sort of a, here's how you do this, uh, here's how you open a bar, focus on craft beer. And, you know, sometimes you find out it actually takes a little bit more knowledge than that. You've actually got to kind of appreciate the beer and not just, um, I've heard Firkins are popular. Can I have one? Um, <laughs> you know, and you know, people have no idea what, you know, basically there's kind of a disconnect because people hear it's a way to make money. Um, and I think that's a big, you know, and the segment is getting, um, you know, it's, it's hot. And, uh, Kind of maybe brings in a lot of other folks that are just you know trying to find a way to make some money, and then that changes things and gets maybe a lot of a lot of folks into it. So that's kind of one thing I see as uh, as coming down the pike. I would agree with that. I think I mean the thing that we've been able to enjoy, and it's it's probably even a little bit different for us than for when you started, is how many great bars there are now to, to serve our beer at. And, we always get asked, you know, like, how do you get along with, you know, with Surly or with Bridge or the other small brewers in the community? You know, everybody wants to know, like, what are your competitors? And, you know, you guys are looking the other way and glaring at Walmart. But other than that, we get along pretty well. Um, and just people want to know, like, how competitive is it? And, I mean, we're all trying to run businesses, but we're at, in this great position where um, there are so many bars opening up more tap hand, or tap points, new bars opening up with... Um, better beer lists, and um, our competition isn't the other guy down the street, it's um, you know, ourselves, like how do we find money to put another tank in and hire another guy to brew more batches, because that's the limiting factor, it's not our competition. You know, in regards to where the industry is going, um, I, by a show of hands, who's heard of a dangerous man brewing? This is good. This is good. So Dangerous Man Brewing, if you're not familiar, um, is a hopefully upstart brewery in Minneapolis. And Minneapolis has a law on its books that says if you're looking to have an on-sale license, a new brewery looking to open a tap room would qualify, you can't be within 200 feet of a religious institution. Um, now, whether that makes sense still, or when it was enacted or not, I don't know. Um, I think Trappist Monks make some pretty darn good beer. Um, they, I, I, I don't necessarily... Not in Minnesota. <laughs> Correct. Uh, but for those that are following it, Dangerous Man Brewing um, is looking to amend that. Currently, in fact, the full city council will take that up uh, for a vote on Friday, and if it passes, they'll have a new model, which goes to where the industry may be going. Um, they're not looking to do a brew pub. They're not looking to be a commercially packaging brewery. All they want to do is brew beer there at their brewery for taproom consumption, and it's almost a, a new take on a coffee shop type of model. Um, I'm sure the guys behind Dangerous Man will correct me and probably misstated it a little bit, but I think it's a really interesting idea and uh, a really great opportunity for Okay, that actually brings me right on to the next question that I had, which was, 
where do you see new models coming out? Um, we're starting to hear more and more about nano brewing, which is kind of like that model. Um, down in Texas, there's Black Star, which is a co-op brewery, um, and there's a few more of those. Hey, um, do you think we're going to start seeing kind of more diversity in the business model for brewing? Um, you know, I think those are all. I guess I, you know, I, I've, I've read about them. I don't know a lot of guys um, that are doing nano breweries. I don't really can't say I've got a great understanding of the co-op model. Um, I think there are all ways to get into the beer business, but I don't know if you know. They're just ways. To, it would seem to me to kind of play around it, but not um, sort of do it commercially. If you're a nano brewery, you can't make enough beer to pay the bills. You, know, you just can't make enough beer at one time. It takes us is. Um, it takes as long to homebrew an all grain batch as it does to make one of a commercial brewery. But we make a lot more. And, and you know, they're you know, that's kinda how it works. Like you've got to be able to make more. So I've, you know, certainly read you know, read stories about nano breweries, guys, uh, gals getting into it, finding out like, oh yeah, there are people that like my beer, I'm good at it, and then you kinda take that next step and get to be a bit a bigger brewery. So I think they're more uh, ways to get in on the cruise of it, but I think the basic model has still got to be pretty much the same as far as those larger scale production places. Co-op, uh, I think you guys can talk a little bit more about that since you've got five partners. The challenges of running a brewery with that many, I can't imagine what you co-op with if you've got 30, 40 people uh, that are going to nitpick on your IPA and how to make it better. That, that's a challenge. <laughs> We have four, not five. <laughs> and four is the exact right amount to be held. But uh, you know, it's, um, I, I would say the same thing. I think I'm all about um, new business models and innovative ways to get into the business. And you know, a lot of you, lot of you know, we, we started out with contract brewing. That was kind of our way in, and that's helped us build our, our brewery here in Minneapolis. And um, that, I think, is continuing to be more and more popular and more acceptable as people realize that you can make exceptional beer and you don't necessarily have to own the brewery, uh, at least you know, to start with. Um, and then the, the nano brewery thing, I think, um, can work. Um, like Omar said, it's difficult, if, if possible at all, to um, build a sustainable business that you're paying the bills and hopefully take home a paycheck um, with a nano model. Although, you know, if you're selling a lot of growlers and pints, you might be able to do that. And, you know, we never really looked that seriously into it, but um, it could be a way into the business for somebody to say, you know, I don't have the, the money or, or the, the wherewithal to go out and get a bunch of investors based on what I do now, but if I put a, a very small nano together and build some buzz around my brand, get some awareness, um, maybe then I build my bigger movie. Um, but it's, it's still tough because um, just like it takes the same amount of time to build, to brew a five gallon or a 1200 gallon batch, um, there is almost as much supporting infrastructure for um, basically a glorified homebrew system as there is for uh, a 20 or 40 barrel system, at least as far as getting something licensed. Um, we did look at a little smaller system, like a three or a seven barrel system when we got started, um, just as different approaches. And the thing is, um, with the if you're in a multi-tenant building, you have to have um, two R-rated firewalls between you and the other tenants, and you have to have um, you know the health department in and public safety. Every single government official you could imagine wants to come see it and make you write a check to somebody else. So you have to go big in order to actually make the business work. Yeah. 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 Ye